Hello, all. my name is uh, Karti Krishnan. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We'll be talking about a case study involving AWS, Teradata, and 7S Media. I'm a solutions architect. I work in a team called Marketplace. And uh, today, I'll be giving you an overview of AWS and how it can uh, help you solve uh, uh, big data problems. And today we have uh, folks from Teradata, Chris Togood, who's the VP of Product and Solutions Marketing. Uh, and from 7 Media, we have David Miller, uh, Director of Business and Data and Business Intelligence, and Sharmine Salas, Head of Data Architecture. So to start off, uh, we all know data has been growing. Right? This, there's been an explosion of uh, mobile devices to sensors to um, social media chatter. and uh, there has been a huge explosion in data. And to give some specific examples, some specific numbers, we are going to see about 1.7 megabytes of new data being generated for every person in this planet by 2020. This is just three years, three or four years from now. So if you think about it, it's a huge amount of data. And uh, what it does is uh, it's going to pull in a lot of frameworks that are going to solve uh, the uh, the issues around storing data, processing data, uh, and uh, deriving insights. Uh, to give another specific number, uh, you know, the big data market frameworks such as Hadoop and Spark and some of the emerging frameworks, they're growing annually 58%. So this, this market is going to keep growing more and more. And in the next three to four years, you can imagine with the, with the amount of data we'll be generating, we're going to see a lot of innovation in this space. And yet, even more interesting data point is that even though lots of data is being generated, very small amount of data is actually being analyzed. So less than about half a percent of data is actually being analyzed. What that means is right now we are at a stage where uh, we are drawing very little insights from the data. We have a lot of data, but uh, we are not able to draw insights from it. And some of the tools and services and products we'll talk about during today's session will give you an idea of where we are heading towards and how they can help solve some of these problems. Now, you know, big data is for everyone. It is not limited to a particular industry or a particular problem problem space. Right? If, you, if you were to compare how the technologies, uh, big data technologies are growing, they are growing more than six times faster than the traditional IT market as a whole. So. It really is one of the fast growing, uh, fast growing technology. And if, just to give some some examples, you know, we list some of the companies that have successfully used AWS and have saw help solve uh, some of their business problems from Finra, Netflix, Unilever, Kellogg's, Cisco, eBay, Siemens, MLBAM. So you know there really isn't any pattern you can see from here. It's it's really spread across different domains, different sectors. They all come up with different kinds of problems. And we all know uh, whoever ends up actually mining their data and discovering patterns in their data and deriving insights in the data will eventually win because they can help solve customers' problem better. Now, why AWS for big data, right? Why the AWS cloud? To, to start off, you can start with an infrastructure with no upfront cost. Right, AWS is immediately available, whether it's in storage or compute or any of the other services. Without any provisioning uh, of the infrastructure, you can you can procure them on demand and use them and only pay for what you need. There is no upfront cost involved at all. And this isn't just giving you a building block such as storage and compute. We also build in broad and deep capabilities surrounding these building blocks and help you solve uh, the actual business problems. For example, whether it's managed database services such as RDS or whether it's Amazon Machine Learning or Elastic MapReduce or QuickSight, you, you have a broad range of services that sort of sit on top of these core building blocks, the compute and storage. And in, in very few flicks, you can actually deploy the solution uh, and um, start deriving insights from your data. And on top of all this, uh, security is, is a very core principle of uh, 
AWS. So we, we give you a lot of constructs around making sure the data you um, either ingest into cloud or you store in the cloud is secure and uh, whether it's, it's encryption at rest or whether it's it's securing the data in transit there are a lot of services and tools that are available to customers to make sure the data that's being held or in in, in, in transit is secure and trusted all of this we provide while giving you scalability right to just along the lines of not having the need to procure the hard, hard infrastructure in advance you can actually scale your infrastructure on demand and you can you can scale up when the, there is a demand spike you can scale down when the demand goes down and you can automatically build build in scalability into your solution without having to worry about uh, any any future uh, usage at all so this all this gives a very compelling reason to, to use AWS. Now, when you solve big data problem, you start from, from you know, collecting data. You want to be able to store. You want to analyze and visualize. Now, there are various tools and services that will help you solve each of this. And like I mentioned, you can, you can use each of those services in each of these um, phases without any long-term commitment. Right? It's pay as you go, build as you as demand comes in, and you tear down when the demand goes goes away. To give a list of services, uh, higher level uh, services that would help you here, for example, whether you are moving for, when you look at the collecting data, whether you are moving data from an on-prem kind of an environment, or whether you are ingesting data into your cloud, uh, there are a lot of services. For example, import and export is one service that allows you to move huge volumes of data from an on-prem world. Snow Snowball is one of our latest innovation. It's a cloud appliance that you can use to to actually uh, move petabytes of data. It's an appliance. You encrypt the data, you push it into the Snowball appliance, and then we get it. We then ingest that data into your environment, and uh, it's this not only reduces the time it takes to ingest huge volumes of data, it also saves costs because if you are to move a uh, lot, lot of these data over the wire, uh, it's, it's going to cost a lot more. In fact, Snowball saves you about 80% of the cost if you were to, to ingest through the internet. Once the data arrives, you have various Direct Connect. Uh, I should also talk about Direct Connect, which is a dedicated pipe from an on-prem world into AWS, it gives you faster throughput, and depending on your throughput needs, you can you can tune the service accordingly. Now, once the data arrives into AWS, you want to be able to store uh, the data into different storage uh, SKUs depending on your throughput needs. For example, you know S3 is our most commonly used uh, building blocks for storing data in cloud, which is the S3 is our object storage. It, think of it like a cloud drive. You you start storing data in a bucket, and as the bucket grows, the data grows, and uh, you can ingest data from S3 into many other services, pretty much all the services, our own services, uh, as well as our partner services, very easily. Glazier is, is, a, is a storage that you typically use for long-term um, archival and backup purposes. You can even set policies to move data from from S3 to Glacier, depending on how hot the data is, uh, you can set policies to S3 saying if the data ages by a certain number of days or a certain months, automatically move to Glacier, thereby you are archiving automatically, all the while uh, without without manually intervening with each of the storage. It's a, it's a policy you set, and then the lifecycle policy takes care of itself. EBS is another storage, uh, which is our block storage. These are the storage devices that typically get get attached to the uh, compute, the EC2 compute instances. And uh, depending on your throughput needs, you have various uh, various ways in which you can you can attach EBS, whether it's um, a, a magnetic disk or SSDs, or you, if you have specific throughput needs, you can you can provision certain IOPS and then you can allocate an EBS to make sure you get a guaranteed throughput. So very flexible to tune those devices according to your needs. EFS is one of our latest service. We launched it last year. 
uh, think reInvent last year, which is our elastic file storage. Essentially, it's an NFS. You can mount that device across different instances, and then um, you can uh, pretty much use it like your typical NFS shared storage. Storage gateway is an is an appliance that sits on on prem and it seamlessly integrates with AWS. Thereby, you have a very easy way to talk to AWS uh, without without uh, intervening uh, as the data comes into your data center. So once the data is stored, you have very many services to analyze them. I list some of them here. EMR is our managed uh, map uh, Hadoop service. It's called Elastic Map Reduce. Literally, in few clicks, you can you can deploy a cluster. It's managed. Uh, we run the instances on your behalf, so you don't need to go and procure uh, and try to install a cluster. It's automatically set with few configuration details. Kinesis is, is our streaming service. You have Kinesis Firehose. You can ingest streaming data, huge volumes of data, and you can run analytics on top of it. You can do things like sliding window analysis. Uh, as the data comes in within a specific window, you can run SQL queries, for example, things of that sort. Elasticsearch is our managed search service. Uh, we also have a new set of services for machine learning. It comes with a lot of core machine learning libraries, and you can you can train your your data and uh, validate your models. And it comes with a visualization engine called QuickSight. So this, by no means, is the entire list of all the services. But what we wanted to give you is a very high level overview of whether uh, whether it's data being stored or analyzed or visualized you have different sets of services that you can you can bring on demand and deploy your solution now uh, you know what kind of what kind of solve solve problems that can you solve with big data so i, I highly encourage you to take a look into aws.amazon.com slash big data slash case studies. It, it lists some of the customers' case studies, how customers have actually used some of these services and solved real business problems. We list some of the top most big data problems solved here, uh, you know, the ETL, clickstream analysis, machine learning, online ads, BI application. So these are uh, real case studies. So you'll find the actual use cases and actual services they were used and I highly encourage you to take a look at look into the link. With that note, that gives a broad overview of AWS. Uh, I would like to hand this webinar over to Chris Stugut from Teradata. All right, Karthik, thanks. Uh, appreciate that. You know, at Teradata, we're all about empowering companies to achieve high impact business outcomes. I mean, whether this has to do with improving customer experiences, helping to drive product innovation, analyze, you know, online click data, transform their finance departments, or even optimize all of their different assets around IoT and sensor data. I mean, our sheer focus on business solutions for analytics is really unparalleled. We bring our leading technology and our architecture expertise to really help companies unleash their potential. We really do this through really three core capabilities. The first one is business analytics solutions. We have analytic business consultants, data scientists that can come in and help you solve core business problems around data and analytics. We also have package solutions like customer journey for marketing environments where they want to be able to understand more transparency about their customer. The second core capability is ecosystem architecture consulting. This is really around expertise to help design optimal architectures using both commercial technology and open source. And then the third area is really around hybrid cloud solutions. Whether you're deploying on a public cloud like Amazon, private cloud, on-premises, or even within a managed cloud infrastructure, we help orchestrate all of those to work well together. Part of the challenge we see, and, and Karthik talked a bit about this, is 
most companies are data rich or insight poor. I mean, Karthik, I love that statistic about 1.7 megabytes of new data for every human every second by 2020. But the problem is, is they're overwhelming amount of data, but we're not getting insights. So we're data rich and insight poor. So most companies are overwhelmed by data, but today data is becoming the number one asset and helping to drive competitive differentiation in the marketplace. But too often what we see is that companies don't know how to use data and analytics to drive new insight. So we are very proud to have partnered with AWS and market, AWS Marketplace to really bring Teradata database to the cloud. We brought our flagship industry-leading data warehouse technology together with the agility and flexibility of the AWS infrastructure. So now, with Teradata, you get self-service. You can go up to Marketplace and self-serve and rapidly deploy and provision Teradata database on AWS. You can pay as you go, even down to just pay for an hour of usage. You can get under an hour provisioning, so you can very rapidly provision this without having to buy hardware and equipment and bring it into your data center. And we've got integration with a wide variety of software tools. I mean, Teradata tools, things like Query Grid for integrating hybrid cloud technologies, Unity for doing replication, as well as Viewpoint for doing system monitoring. But you can also integrate with a lot of third-party tools like Tableau and Attunity, as well as interact with and integrate with a number of the tools that Karthik was talking about around Amazon EBS and S3 for storage. If you look at this, this gives you the ability and the trust of more than 1,400 Teradata customers worldwide. I mean, Teradata has really been the gold standard for data warehousing. If you look at our success in different industries. We have nine of the top 10 telcos around the world. We have nine of the top 10 financial banks. We have seven of the top retailers in the market. And we have eight of the top 10 manufacturers. So whatever industry you're engaged in, Teradata can help you. And now we've made Teradata even more accessible by deploying on top of AWS. With this deployment, Teradata database on AWS, we delivered the best price performance in the industry. In fact, we've seen as much as 100x better performance over some of the leading cloud databases that are out there in the marketplace. And it's very simple to use. It's all sold via AWS Marketplace. You just go up to the product listing page. You can see here's an example of that page. You can see that it's as simple as selecting the software that you want. You can select whether you want hourly or annual pricing. If you do annual pricing, we give an additional 23% discount for a longer type of commitment. And we just announced yesterday on Monday that we've expanded our support with the Teradata database on AWS up to 64 nodes. So even though you see it there at 32 nodes today, we can take it up to 64 nodes. And you can start with Teradata Database on AWS starting as little as $2 per hour. So easy to consume, you know, rapid provisioning, pay as you go, integration, and then really leveraging world-class utilizations of customers around the world. And all of this, it's very easy to get started. You can either do it yourself, you can go up to marketplace on AWS and just integrate on the product page and bring it together, or you can engage with us to help you. You know, at Teradata, we have more than 2,450 associates that are certified or accredited on AWS, and we can help you with ingestion, we can help you with data warehouse design, we can help you with onboarding, with managed services, all of this on top of the AWS infrastructure. So we're happy to help. So either do it yourself or we can help you execute that. I am now pleased to introduce David Miller from Seven West Media. Seven West Media is one of our customers that we're very excited about that has 
brought together and leveraged Teradata Database on top of AWS. And we wanted you to have an opportunity to hear their story. Dave? Thanks, Chris. So, so Seven West Media is um, Australia's leading uh, multiple media platform uh, company. Uh, we have um, lead market leading presence in TV with our channel 7, 7 2, and 7 Mate, and a range of leading um, magazine and newspaper publications, as well as a growing portfolio of online properties, including a um, substantial uh, joint venture with Yahoo. The group um, reaches over 17 million Australians uh, every month, which is out of a total population of 23 million. So we have substantial reach here in Australia. Uh, Seamless Media is also the home of the Olympic Games in Australia, um, having secured the rights to the Games uh, this year in, uh, in, in Rio, um, but also extending through to the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang in 2018 and uh, Tokyo in 2020. So from a uh, company strategy perspective, we are heavily invest invested in uh, the Olympics as part of our longer term corporate strategy. So the business challenge for us was, with that as a longer term goal, was how would we go about delivering the Olympics in a new and innovative way. And so we set the goal of delivering the very first unmissable Olympic Games here in Australia. And that involved uh, not only broadcasting across our three TV channels, but also making that content available across an array of additional platforms, including social. But the cornerstone of our digital delivery was the creation of bespoke Seven Olympics website and app, where people would be able to access the broadcast streams, as well as additional content that wasn't available on the broadcast. And then for premium users, they would have the ability uh, to see a uh, full 3,000 hours worth of content across 36 high definition channels, which meant that the games would be pretty much unmissable. Having that digital property available meant that uh, we could then tap into a whole bunch of new business opportunities through leveraging the data that would be generated. And so we, uh, we focused on three key outcomes we wanted to achieve. First was leveraging the data to deliver new insights. The second was use the data to try and drive user engagement with the games themselves. And the third was to capture the data in a way that would create an audience asset for us, which we could use to underpin our longer term strategy around content delivery and in particular around our long term commitment for the Olympics. So we focused on three key uh, parts to delivering the solution. Uh, the first was uh, traditional business intelligence, taking all the data and generating a, a comprehensive suite of dashboards covering all the critical KPIs that the business needed to track uh, throughout the event. Uh, these dashboards were delivered every day um, off the vast amount of data that was coming through uh, to our inside teams as well as to key stakeholders and included um, an executive dashboard with the top line KPIs which were pushed directly to uh, key execs on their mobile devices wherever they were. And that included some of our execs who were over in Rio, um, either hosting clients or involved in the broadcast itself. So that gave us some really powerful insights through the games. The second thing we focused on was the data would allow us to start to understand how individuals were engaging with the, engage with the games. Um, and so we tracked about 200 metrics per person, um, either at a device level or at a registered user level, for us to understand how people were engaging with the games overall, but also how people were engaging with individual sports within the games. Uh, included to that, we also had our data scientists build um, a statistical model which would look at people's usage to the games, look at the sports that they were watching, and see if we could determine whether an individual had a preferred sport uh, what, something that they favored. And this gave us deep insights in terms of, at a person level, how people were engaging with the games. And that continues to be useful for us as we look at uh, planning content and products in the future. That also meant uh, we could drive a very sophisticated and proactive user engagement program, which is the, the third part of our solution. And here, where for people who had registered um, on the games and given us their details, we tracked how their engagement was changing over time. And so people, uh, for example, people who had been watching and then stopped watching the games, 
uh, after 48 hours, we would send them a message saying, hey, you're missing out on the games. Here's a reminder about uh, what's coming up and, and here's the schedule. On the other end of the spectrum, people who were actively engaging in the games but weren't yet premium users, we would promote the benefits of the premium service. And for those people who we'd been able to identify as having a preferred sport, those messages were actually customised. So a swimming fan would get a swimming-based message, whereas a basketball fan would get a basketball-based message. And so what was the outcome? From, from our perspective, massively successful um, through those uh, 17 days of the Olympics, uh, over 18 million Australians accessed Olympic content. Um, of those, just under 3 million accessed our digital product. And those people generated uh, 325 million minutes of streamed usage. And put that into context, that's 11% of the equivalent number from NBC, but just uh, of just 7% of the population. So from our perspective, uh, this was a sign of really strong uh, engagement uh, from our users, which was, um, which was a fantastic outcome. Of the, digital, of the digital users, uh, over a million people chose to register uh, with us. And so those people went through our engagement program. And uh, that ended up delivering just on 2.7 million emails over the two weeks, individualized uh, bespoke uh, campaigns. And when we looked after the games in terms of how that performed, we could measure a 29% increase in the average minutes that people consumed when we compared the people who had engaged with the program versus a control group who received no messages at all. So for us, this is a really strong indicator of how we could use data to actually drive better engagement and drive a strong business outcome. And so what we end up with is a very strong uh, audience asset, which gives deep insights into people that we never were able to see before. And that is helping to drive our business as we look at uh, delivering content in the future, and in particular is really strong for our preparations for future uh, Olympic events. With all those great outcomes, um, the, it wasn't, wasn't without its challenges. Uh, and what I'd like to do is hand over to uh, Charmaine Salas, who is our Head of Data Architecture, who can talk you through how we overcame those challenges. Thank you, Dave. So what were some of the key data challenges we had at uh, Seven Best Media? Now, we had to support a very fast-growing digital streaming business, and hence there was a clear need for, for technical agility and availability. The ever-increasing data volumes was also another challenge. Now, we received hundreds of millions of viewing data events in early batches every day. And due to the nature of our business, we received large data spikes during key events like the Australian Open and the Olympic Games. So we really needed a scalable environment that could easily handle the streaming data that we were now receiving in burst. Now this data is also extremely complex in nature and requires extensive preparation and correlation to turn these granular events into viewing sessions. So to realize all our business objectives, and to address these key data challenges, we really needed an integrated platform that could operate in a scalable environment. So then, why cloud? And uh, why did we decide to go with AWS? Now, we had to make a decision as to whether we're going to host all our data infrastructure. And as you would know, this is not a trivial decision by any means. Now, at that time, the cloud environments were also maturing. And we knew that cloud is the future. So what were the key criteria that helped make our decision to move to the cloud easy? The first one was elasticity. Now, this was by far one of our biggest considerations. With a fast-growing digital business, we didn't have great forecast. And to cater to the spikes meant that we would have to provision a lot of hardware and storage months in advance. And the key thing here that was that we may or may not use it. There was also this risk of uh, under-provisioning and not being able to manage our growing business needs. Now, the cloud really came to our rescue and uh, helped solve that challenge for us. Has it provided us with that flexibility to um, grow and shrink our environment as and when we needed it? We were also able to test and add additional instances just a few days in advance of the event 
Now, this definitely would not have been possible with a data center-based approach. The next factor was um, storage. Now, the AWS S3 storage layer allowed us to handle those large data spikes without the need to even provision any storage in advance. And it was extremely cost effective. Now, all this data, whether it's raw or backups, it's always on S3. The data in S3 is stored uh, across multiple data locations, and hence it can sustain concurrent data loss in two locations. So this durability that S3 offers meant that our data is protected, even in a disaster situation. Another factor was uh, agility, and uh, this was a key decision point for us. Now, with AWS, we were able to rapidly deploy hardware instances and software solutions incrementally. So this really allowed us to respond to all that growing business demands in a very agile manner. Integration was also another key factor. Now, all our digital uh, platforms and uh, most of our data sources, they're hosted on AWS. So better integration and uh, also avoiding the cost of moving all this data out of AWS influenced our decision further to move to the AWS cloud. Now, we were also able to quite easily integrate our uh, existing tool sets within AWS. The next factor is security. Now, this factor is uh, extremely important, especially when you're discussing with your IT team about uh, moving to the cloud. Now, our data environment within AWS is an extension of our corporate network. We worked very closely for days with our IT security team and uh, some of the AWS experts to come up with a robust security framework. And this really allowed us to manage security at a very granular level in our environment. And finally, cost. Now, the reason I put this in the end is to indicate that cost was not the only factor that was driving our decision to move to the cloud. With the flexible pricing option that uh, AWS provides, it was very cost effective as compared to all the other deployment options uh, that we were considering. So then, once we decided that cloud was the way we wanted to go, the work to set up uh, our data platform started with a pilot around the end of uh, 2015, just in time to support the 2016 Australian Open. Now, uh, we deployed our big data solution on AWS using uh, Cloudera's distribution of Hadoop, and this really formed uh, that core of our data architecture, and it allowed us to handle um, the large digital streaming data and process it quite effectively. So then, I guess the next question you may have is that why do we deploy Teradata on AWS? Now, from the Australian Open experience, we gained valuable insights as to what was really needed to support a high-profile event like the Olympic Games. With increasing data sources, mixed workloads, and also the need to manage the critical business SLAs, we quickly identified that we really needed a database platform. Now, this platform would uh, definitely have to scale to support concurrent use as our business uses increased. So then we started evaluating multiple database options, and the Teradata offering on AWS was extremely compelling. It was also perfect from a timing perspective, as uh, Teradata had just launched their cloud offering on AWS. So then, what were the key reasons, and uh, why did we decide to go with Teradata? Well, Teradata is clearly a mature database, and it has been around for decades. The Teradata offering on AWS meant that we now had access to the same mature database technology with all the benefits that the cloud offered. We were able to quite easily and seamlessly integrate the Teradata environment within our app within our existing data ecosystem on AWS. It had all the features of a production enterprise-grade system, and hence it provided that reliable and stable platform for us. Now, this was extremely critical for us, as uh, we were going to support one of our biggest digital streaming events. The one-click deployment option, um, the Teradata system uh, allowed us to, you know, it was really, it really helped us to, um, deploy the uh, database platform quite quickly, and uh, the Teradata system was up and running in a matter of few hours. Also, the subscription-based pricing option on AWS Marketplace was extremely competitive from a uh, pricing option compared to all the other database options that we considered. 
Now, with the Teradata Managed Services, we had a fully managed Teradata environment, which included services such as DBS support, monitoring, and administration of our Teradata AWS resources. We were able to quite quickly ramp up the service during the Olympic Games for extra hours and uh, to provide that weekend coverage for us. Now, this allowed us to focus on the business solution and derive insights rather than running the database platform. So while we started with a single node instance, we were very well aware of Teradata's plans to launch the MPP offering on AWS. This was really important for us as uh, we had to ensure that the database platform was scalable to meet our future needs. The next section is the 7 West Media's data platform. And um, I will take you through how we collect and process all this data and uh, what really enables these various business outcomes for us. S3, now this is the core of our data architecture, and it is the key storage layer across our data platform. It serves as a data landing layer in our architecture, so all the large volumes of streaming data from all our digital products across the various devices lands on S3 buckets in our lead batches every day, and this is where it's made available for processing. S3 is also used uh, as a data lake in our architecture, that is, any data that's worth retaining um, for analytics, it's stored on S3. Now, we retain all our raw data on S3, and it is easily accessible from Hadoop via Hive table. S3 also serves as a backup in our architecture. That is, once this data is landed uh, on S3 and it's processed and curated, it's written back to S3. Hence, all our critical data at any point, it's always available on S3. The next component of our architecture is the Hadoop environment. Now, we use Cloudera's distribution of Hadoop, and it is a nine-node cluster. It serves as a data preparation and uh, an analytics platform in our architecture. Now, all this digital streaming data that lands on S3 gets curated and processed in our Hadoop cluster. We use a combination of uh, Hive, Pig, Impala, and Python to perform complex transformation on this data which then turns them into viewing sessions. Now, the data is also summarized, uh, and it's aggregated in our Hadoop cluster before it even makes its way to Teradata for uh, wide enterprise use. Now, only the transient and hot data that's accessed by analytics is stored on HDFS. The next component uh, is the Teradata platform, and this is where most of our reporting and analytics happens. Now, the detailed event-level data gets processed and summarized in Hadoop before it makes its way to Teradata. And this summarized data is then further integrated in Service Media's data warehouse. Now, the data in Teradata is made available for wider enterprise use, that is, for self-serve reporting, dashboards, marketing application, and for analytics. We use the Hadoop uh, Teradata Hadoop connector to move large volumes of data between uh, our Hadoop and our Teradata environment, and it is extremely fast. Now, I would definitely recommend that you consider um, the Teradata Hadoop connector, especially when you're looking at uh, moving data between uh, Teradata and Hadoop in your architecture. Now, also the event-level data in Hadoop uh, is uh, accessible from Teradata using the Teradata query grid, and this allows us to join um, the Hadoop data to all the other data in our Teradata tables. We use uh, the data stream utility to support all the Teradata backup and uh, restore operations, while the workload management allows us to do granular resource allocation, which allows us to support all, that, all those SLAs uh, when we have competing workloads. Now, once all this data is on Hadoop and Teradata, it can be easily accessed via various tools for analytics, marketing, and for report reporting. We use R in our environment as our data science and modeling tool, which runs on a dedicated analytics node, and it can easily access data from both Hadoop and Teradata. Impala, which has a SQL-like syntax, allows us to quite easily and quickly access data from Hadoop, whereas the Teradata Studio provides uh, that GUI-based query access to data that resides on Teradata. We use Tableau as our enterprise reporting tool for dashboards, self-serve reporting, and for visualization. 
data is also made available to our email marketing platform, which drove our customer engagement program during the Olympic Games. So the last component is security and monitoring. Now, security is uh, really important, uh, especially when you're storing data in the cloud. And we implemented using a combination of the AWS Virtual Private Cloud, identity and access management, database and application level security. Now, what this allows us to do is uh, it provides a very layered approach to security in our environment. The data platform monitoring and administration is also done via AWS CloudWatch, Cloudera Manager, Teradata Server Management, and Teradata Viewpoint. So finally, what are some of the key takeaways and uh, learnings from our implementation? Always start small, but uh, ensure that your architecture is scalable. Try and model what your base configuration needs to look like as for your current needs. And then you can always add on additional capacity as and when you need it. Don't try and apply your uh, data center-based practice to a cloud architecture. Now, at 7 West, um, we have a base configuration which is modeled around our uh, BAU processing and um, workloads. And during key events like the Olympic Games, uh, we added additional data nodes just a few days in advance of the event to give us that additional capacity and uh, we shrunk back to our base configuration right after the event. Which brings us to the next point, uh, that is architect for cost. Now, at 7 West Media, we reserve our base configuration, which provides that significant cost savings for us. And um, it's, this is definitely something that's uh, worth looking at, um, especially when you have um, peak workloads, and you can always add uh, instances on demand um, on an hourly pricing. Security is key, as I said earlier, uh, especially when you're storing data in the cloud, uh, ensure that you apply security at all layers, whether it's uh, network, storage, application, and database. But don't forget to turn on auditing. Now, you could use uh, AWS CloudTrail logs to audit your AWS environment and track each action on the cluster. Now, this allows you to track who's accessing your environment uh, and what as well. The next point is um, continuously optimize your AWS environment. Now, AWS is always releasing new features and services, and so is Teradata. So keep reassessing your architecture decisions and ensure that you're using the benefits that both AWS and Teradata offer. And finally, design and test for failure scenarios. Now, this is applicable for any architecture and uh, more so for the cloud. Now, during the Olympic Games, we ran, um, and much before that, actually, we ran performance and load tests uh, to ensure that the data platform could handle those large data spikes. We also tested for uh, various failure scenarios to ensure that our AWS environment was very robust and available. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Charmaine. This is uh, Brian Wood. I'm going to lead the Q&A session here. We've got a few questions that have come in. Uh, please continue to submit questions. I'm just going to take them in order. Uh, Charmaine, the first question is for you. How much data was involved in the project? Can you give us a sense of that? Uh, so during the Olympic uh, Games, we received, um, I mean, across the event, we received 700 million records. And, um, you know, that those were the raw events uh, that we received um, across, um, you know, from various products, across various devices. And, um, you know, that data got processed, curated, summarized. And um, the data that was finally used for reporting uh, was around, uh, you know, 200, 200 million records. That was, uh, that was what was served on Teradata. Great, thank you. Next question for Dave. Uh, can you explain more about what Teradata Services did for 7 West Media, both before and during the Olympics? Sure. So um, we were moving very, very, very quickly, as uh, Shemaine said. In fact, yeah, the, um, we started almost with a blank sheet of paper uh, about one year before the Olympic Games and progressively built up the architecture that uh, Shemaine is talking about. Um, when it came to the Teradata solution, 
Um, that was only selected uh, about seven weeks before the Games. And uh, so we worked very closely with the um, Teradata Managed Services teams and professional services to help, uh, together with some AWS experts and our local guys, um, to basically get the um, Teradata component uh, up and running and operational within, um, within three weeks. So a month before the Games, we were ready. And uh, Teradata were instrumental in getting um, that solution up uh, as quickly as, as we did. And then um, we transitioned the actual running of the Teradata database over to Teradata Managed Services. And so they ran the Teradata environment for us uh, through the games and continue, continue to do so uh, right now. Um, so yeah, very, very good partnership with the uh, Teradata Professional Services and Managed Services teams. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, this next question for Chris. Uh, is the Teradata software in AWS the same as what's available in other Teradata products, or is it a de-featured offering? Yeah, no, thanks, Brian. You know, one of the things that I think is very unique with Teradata's hybrid cloud approach is that we've been able to take the exact same database and deploy it across the public cloud infrastructure, on-premises, our private cloud, and our managed cloud. So we have Teradata 15.10, and that's available uh, in AWS in Marketplace. And the other key point uh, is that it is a full feature database. A lot of people might think, well, did you dummy down the database? And we absolutely did not. I mean, it includes all of the features that you would get in on-premises. We've included our TASM for workload management and SLAs. Uh, we've included streams for loading, all of your load and export utilities, uh, Unity, everything to give you a full production environment. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this one for Charmaine, um, are the other connected pieces in this architecture, such as Cloudera and Tableau, are they also purchased through AWS Marketplace? Now, we, uh, we've gone directly to Cloudera and Tableau, uh, and we use our uh, existing license keys um, on AWS. We, uh, we didn't use the Marketplace for that. Great. Uh, next one for Dave. Uh, approximately how many users per query or queries were served at the peak times in the, in the, during the games? Um, so the, most of the processing was done with um, just scheduled reports that were going out. So the number of users directly accessing uh, the environment was quite limited. Uh, we're kind of at the beginning of our journey in terms of using data um, in this way. And so there are only a handful of people who are um, able uh, and trained to um, use these kind of assets. So we didn't have an extensive number of, of uh, users accessing the, um, the environment. Most of it was you know, pre-canned um, jobs that were pushing out reports. And then the, um, the reports are then actively used across uh, you know, a whole range of people across the, um, across the business. And so we're now. You know, now it's part of the, that's awakened the organization as to what's possible in this way. And so we're now working on a, a, a strategy to start to roll this kind of capability out more broadly across, uh, across the business. So it's formed a really great foundation, um, showing what's possible. And now we're starting to look at how we activate more people across the, um, across the business to access the, um, these kind of capabilities. Thank you, Dave. Next question for Chris. How does Teradata connect to Hadoop? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so Charmaine talked a little bit about our Teradata Hadoop connector. What this connector does is it's a scoop-based connector, which is for really bulk data movement uh, in moving data from a Hadoop cluster, uh, as in this case Cloudera, over to, to Teradata. And we do it in a high-speed parallel way. We also have a, another connector, which is called Teradata Query Grid. And what Query Grid does is enables you to do dynamic connection at runtime in the query. So let's say that you're storing some raw data within the Hadoop cluster and you want to be able to dynamically join it with some of the information that you've integrated within your data warehouse infrastructure. You can use Query Grid to reach at runtime on the query into the Hadoop cluster, bring the data back in, join it together, either put it into spool or you can even persist it down to um, disk. But the beauty about 
connectivity between you know Teradata database and Hadoop is we have multiple options with Query Grid as well as the the Teradata connector uh, for Hadoop doing more you know bulk data movement. Great, thank you, Charmaine. This one's for you. What was your backup and restore strategy? Did you use uh, snapshots or, uh, or or what? So uh, for our backups, we used a combination of, um, you know, so we used the Teradata Stream Utility, which um, allows you to backup your class, uh, you know, your Teradata database on uh, your EBS volumes. So it has EBS volumes attached uh, to your data uh, stream utility um, instance. And, uh, and then once the data was on EBS, we again took snapshots of that data and uh, and, and stored those snapshots on S3. So we had, I guess, two steps to the backup process. And uh, what I understand now and what we're looking at is uh, looking at uh, integrating DSU with S3, where Teradata has just, off, um, just launched uh, the new, in the new version, to, which allows you to back up your data from Teradata directly uh, to S3. So we wouldn't need uh, the EBS storage um, there. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Dave, this one's for you. Um, question came in. Uh, the viewer was not sure whether Seven West was already a Teradata customer with on-premises infrastructure before this project, or did you start with Teradata just straight from the cloud? Yeah. So um, we we started from scratch. Uh, as I said earlier on, um, a year before the games, we literally had nothing. Um, we had a blank sheet of paper, and we started planning out um, with a with a growing digital strategy and more and more products being created. And with the um, Australian Open coming up at the beginning of the, of this year, and then uh, the Olympics in the future, uh, we started planning uh, probably back in about June, July last year and uh, did the original pilot, the Hadoop-based pilot, for the Australian Open in January. Uh, and so the Teradata solution, the selection process for um, that data w database um, happened in uh, May this year. Uh, and we built from scratch, so seven weeks out from the games, we started the work uh, with the Teradata team uh, to put the environment in place. So we had nothing um, to start with, uh, and uh, we built it all. Um, within within a year, and I think that's another point you know that Charmaine's making and, and the team are making around how quick and how easy it is to stand up these kind of um, really leading edge capabilities in such a short space of time. You couldn't have done this you know four or five years ago. Um, so yeah, it, it it was it's the timing worked really well for us that these these capabilities were mature enough and we could move really fast to support an event like the Olympics with, with such a short time frame. Great, thank you. Uh, Charmaine, what, what does uh, Seven West Media plan to do next with regard to customer analytics? I'll take that if that's OK. Um, so the, the plan is, you know, we, with, with creating this um, data asset, uh, there are a bunch of things. It, there's two kind of main, main streams. The first is how we leverage the data that has been created, this audience asset that we now have. We've got this scaled set of data about um, people. They've shared their preferences with us. We understand their sporting likes. Um, we understand how they engage with both the product and with marketing messages. And so that's formed a really key asset for us uh, in terms of how we plan future uh, delivery of content. So this is going into product analytics around how people should we, how we should be designing the, our products going forward, but also in terms of engagement strategies for customers uh, in the future. So the analytics around that continues to um, evolve. And the second thing is uh, rolling out these dashboards uh, to the business. Um, we're now on this, this transformation journey to roll out more and more analytics across the business that leverage, uh, leverages our growing data assets. So um, we'll continue to go down routes of um, more reports, um, more self-service uh, for reports, uh, and start to look at some self-service um, capabilities for our, our um, key stakeholders to get direct, more direct access to some of the data assets we've created. So it's an exciting place for us, and, and there's, there's a great future going um, uh, to, to, to drive the transformation off the back of this. 
Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Charmaine, here's, here's one for you. How big was your team uh, that was involved in the project, both for the implementation phase and as well as during the Olympics operation themselves? Um, we we really had a mix of uh, you know internal team um, internal resources and um, you know our partners um, which um, we specialize in big data services. Uh, so our internal team really comprised of uh, four to five developers, um, and then we had uh, the extension to the team um, supported by our partners, uh, which is an uh, Australian leading um, um, analytics company called Contexty that supported. Uh, a big data environment and really manage that environment for us. And on the Teradata side, uh, we had uh, the Teradata Managed Services, uh, which um, helped manage the Teradata environment, you know, operationally for us. Um, and so it was a very small and tight implementation team, which really knew what we were doing. And um, you know, it was it was um, it was a project that we did in a period of. Um, you know, the planning started six months in advance, uh, and obviously the preparation of the environment. But the implementation really, um, you know, we implemented it in a matter of um, three to four months, leading to the event. Great. Thank you. Dave, another one for you. What type of data, for example, video or customer audience data or game info from the Olympics was distributed across Hadoop, Teradata, and your own uh, enterprise data system. So um, all the data um, landed in the um, in the uh, uh, Hadoop environment first. Um, so it was mainly the um, the main sources were sort of video video related, related data. We also had impression data for um, ad delivery through through DFP. Um, and uh, all the heavy lifting is done in the in the Hadoop environment, and then customer-related data is managed in the uh, in the Teradata environment. So all the user registrations and their profiles that's managed in the da in the um, in the Teradata environment, uh, and then the aggregated. You know, when we so when we looked at the viewing data, for example, um, and would assign uh, a preferred sport to an individual or track. Uh, sporting consumption at an individual level, those attributes get added to an individual record in the Teradata environment. Thank you. <clears throat> Question for Chris. Uh, how flexible are the configuration options for Teradata software on AWS? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, that's a, that's a really good question, right? A lot of people typically think about Teradata software being you know linked to a specific set of you know physical hardware and the beauty of being able to deploy the Teradata database on AWS is we're deploying it as software so you can take that uh, that software you can deploy it inside of a marketplace you can put it on HDD systems you can put it on SSD systems you can put it on um, EBS systems within the infrastructure there's a wide choice of not only the different types of uh, infrastructure from AWS that you can deploy, but there's also a wide choice of scalability options. You can start as simple as a single node, and as I mentioned, you know today can scale up to 32 nodes, and then we announced the ability to get to 64, which will be coming up here in, in a couple of weeks. But also there's a lot of uh, software options around the flexibility, so you can get the, the Teradata database, you can get a lot of the backup that Charmaine was, ta Charmaine was talking a lot about. You can get Query Grid uh, within that environment. You can get TASM within that environment. And we've even brought our Astra Analytics model up into AWS. So there's lots of flexible options uh, to be able to deploy Teradata within AWS. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right. To keep us on time, we're going to wrap up the Q&A here. Uh, Jerry, turn it back to you, please. All right, well, thank you. And so we're going to go ahead and close down our session at this point. We do appreciate everybody spending the time with us today and our presenters and panelists for all the great content. So this time we'll disconnect from our session.